Welcome to First Look Florida State Football. Tom Block, Keith Jones. The season is finally just about here and a lot of enthusiasm about Florida State, KJ, as the Knolls enter as a top 10 team in the preseason polls once again. Two themes, Tommy, have been talked about. Winter, summer, and now in the fall camp. Focus on the details, eliminate the clutter. This is a team that's very focused on a goal of ACC championship game and for hopefully an NCAA national championship game. Well, Florida State has a loaded roster. They've recruited well. Jimbo Fisher enters his third year. We'll talk offense, defense, special teams. Get you set for the Florida State season. Stay with us. We are just kicking off first look Florida State football. football team will open the season and stay at home for the first four games of the month of September. They'll get into the conference slate and of course wrap up against Florida and a lot of enthusiasm as always KJ. Before we look too far ahead, a year ago expectations were high, optimism was high and Florida State went nine and four. There was a mix of, uh, of good and not so good as the season played out. Stumbled after the Oklahoma game then reeled off uh, six wins out of their last seven contests and you mentioned something Tommy that I think is kind of interesting. Last year a lot of optimism. Everybody thought well maybe this team is where it needs to be. We got Oklahoma, we get past that, maybe this will be a great year. This year, anticipation. And in my world, that's two completely, though related, two completely different things. This squad, this coaching staff, in fact, the season ticket holders and fans expect great things out of this 2012 team, and they're going to have to work hard in order to make it happen. A season ago, a bowl victory over Notre Dame, uh, another win over Miami, another win over Florida. That was, uh, those were certainly the high points for the season for FSU. They really were, but before we get too far ahead, let's take a look back at the entire 2011 season. The Seminoles entered the 2011 campaign with lofty expectations. Those expectations were fueled by equal parts confidence from a 10-win season in 2010 and a media hype that had fans talking a possible national championship. Uh, you know, we got, we got caught up in the hype a little bit. You know, uh, no preseason rankings. The first two Saturdays of the fall, FSU didn't encounter any NCAA heavyweights but took care of business efficiently by blanking the University of Louisiana Monroe 34 zip in the opener and running roughshod over Charleston Southern 62-10 in week two. With the early season tune-up out of the way, the eyes of the nation turned to Dope Campbell Stadium as the Seminoles hosted top-ranked Oklahoma in the marquee matchup of the year. But the injury bug hit the Knolls hard in the third quarter, with starting quarterback E.J. Manuel going down with a shoulder injury. Backup Clint Trickett led a game garnet and gold squad that faltered late in the contest and fell to the number one ranked Sooners 23-13. ACC play began the following week as FSU traveled to Death Valley for a meeting with the Clemson Tigers. In his first career start, Clint Trickett responded with an impressive outing completing 24 of 38 passes for 336 yards and three scores. But a subpar defensive effort combined with 11 penalties totaling 124 yards sunk the Seminoles as they lost the conference opener 35-30 and even their season mark at two and two. After a bye week, it was up to Winston-Salem where the Seminoles had a sense Woo! of deja vu and another heartbreaking 35-30 loss. With his shoulder not 100%, E.J. Manuel took over the reins of a stagnant offense in the second quarter. 
despite the return of their starting signal caller and a fifth straight outstanding receiving day from freshman Richard Green, the Seminoles could not overcome the Demon Deacons, who sent them to their third straight defeat. The biggest thing that I thought about last season is that we fought back. You know, uh, we lost those um, three games, Oklahoma, Clemson, and Wake Forest, and that was tough for us. You know, obviously we didn't want to lose any games, but I, th I thought we fought back with injuries, you know, not just myself, but other guys on the team fought through those injuries and we were able to string, you know, string along some wins. From the depths of a two and three start, the Seminoles began the long climb up. Offense and defense teamed up in consecutive 41-16 dominations of both Duke and Maryland. And the early season defensive woes were left in the rearview mirror the following week as the Seminoles held Maryland to just 166 total yards in route to blanking the Turks 34 zip. Defensive coordinator Mike Stoops' troops were aided by an FSU offense led by E.J. Manuel's 321 passing yards and two touchdown tosses in a career-high 25 completions. Four days later, the Seminole Express made its way up to Chestnut Hill as FSU met Boston College in a nationally televised Thursday night game. The defense forced four turnovers as the Seminoles dominated the Eagles for their fourth straight victory. Their 6-3 record ensured a nationwide best current bowl eligible streak, which would extend to 30 consecutive years. The following week, the University of Miami Hurricanes made their biennial visit to Tallahassee. From the opening possession, the game was defined by physical, ferocious play and controversy. FSU held a 23-7 fourth quarter lead before the Hurricanes made a late push. Aided by a controversial personal foul call on linebacker Nigel Bradham, but freshman Nick O'Leary's recovery of Miami's last gas onside attempt sealed the 23-19 win. Against Virginia, a lackluster offensive performance and a late touchdown surrendered by the defense set the stage for the season's most bizarre ending. The final Seminole drive had more twists and turns than a mystery novel. The roller coaster ride ended with Dustin Hopkins' game-winning attempt in the 14-13 setback. Obviously, for me personally, I wish I, I could have had the uh, Virginia game back and just uh, got that kick, but that's not how it works. So uh, sometimes it works in your favor, sometimes it doesn't. Against Florida, the late season offensive woes continued as the Seminoles could muster only 95 total yards on the night. But the defense made sure their offensive teammates had only short distances to cover. Two interceptions set up a pair of Devontae Freeman one-yard scores. The secondary capped the scoring with Terrence Park's 29-yard interception return, sealing a triumph that earned the Seminoles their second consecutive state championship. The postseason prize was a trip to Orlando to face Notre Dame in the Champs Sports Bowl. Attrition along the offensive line saw the Knolls start four freshmen in the trenches. The inexperience reared its head early as E.J. Manuel was forced to run for his life the entire first half. The only score of the half came from a Notre Dame fumble return as FSU headed into the locker room down 7-zip. The final 30 minutes, however, were an entirely different story. An early second half Irish TD was soon negated as the young O-line grew up in a hurry as the Seminoles scored 18 straight points en route to an 18-14 victory. The second half surge not only clinched the Seminoles' fourth consecutive bowl win that set up confidence and momentum for the 2012 season. If, anytime you can get those bowl games and get those under your belt and get a, get a win, it's, a, it's huge momentum. Just uh, It caps off a season. It makes you feel good about the year. An awful lot of experience returning for Florida State this year, and it starts at the most important position of quarterback where E.J. Manuel enters his fifth year, second year as a starter, performed well last year, but there's a lot of people that really feel he can take it to an even higher level this year. What we didn't know is that most of last year, E.J. played hurt. We know he got hurt in the Oklahoma game. He ended up getting hurt in the bowl game, had some surgery in the offseason, but you're exactly right. He's had entire winter, summer, fall camp healthy. If he stays healthy, he has a chance, Tommy, to be one of the best in the ACC, if not in the country. You always want to stay flexible, and that's something I really worked on. Just want to go out there and play 100% and hope, you that, hope that you don't get injured. Well, he's got great size, great frame, obviously. Experience is on his side. 
One thing that, uh, that worked against him, maybe he saw ghosts at times, was the offensive line, which was depleted due, a, due to a plethora of injuries a year ago. Uh, that O-line should be improved this season. Well, I don't mean it exactly the way it sounds, but they've got nowhere to go up. As mentioned earlier, four freshmen started in that bowl game. They've got plenty of depth. If you talk to all the coaching staff on the offensive side, they've got plenty of talent. The only thing they don't have, experience. They're going to have to grow up quickly and protect EJ and give him the opportunity to stand in the pocket and throw the ball and not just be running around all the time. Again, coaching staff says plenty of talent, just need some reps. Yeah, they made huge strides. I'm they're, putting in, they're definitely putting in the work. Well, if they do give him opportunity to throw the football, there's going to be some good results because this, this is a receiving core that uh, I'm sure if you asked Jimbo Fisher, he wouldn't trade his group of pass catchers with any other group on any team in the country. There's not another group like this in the conference, that's for sure, and maybe not in the country. You've got kids like Halstead that's coming back that missed the entire year. Rashad Green, the freshman, had just a fabulous first half. You've got tight ends with O'Leary. You've got uh, Kelvin Benjamin coming in, the freshman that was just lights out in the spring. There's plenty of talent out there. Kenny Shaw, plenty of people to throw the ball to. You've just got to protect EJ and give him an opportunity to get it down the field. And just as the offensive line needs to protect for EJ. They also need to open up some holes for the ground game, which has some veterans back. It's hard to think of Devontae Freeman as a veteran, but he was the guy last year as a freshman, and, and it's certainly not insignificant that Chris Thompson is back. Uh, he was Mr. Explosive a couple of years ago and missed last year most of it with injury. Thompson with that back injury has come back after surgery, and he's better than ever, according to him. And Keep your eye on Lonnie Pryor. This is a kid that uh, had a great year a couple of years ago. Not a lot of productivity last year, but look for him to maybe get his hands on the ball eight or ten times. He's lost a little weight. He's a little quicker. Plenty of talent at wide receiver and running back. Offensive line, as we've talked about, being the key. So when you look at the offense, there obviously is a, a still a higher ceiling they can reach, but there's an awful lot of potential there. Now, defense, different story there. They're a proven commodity, one of the top defenses in the country a year ago, and the same is expected this year. When we come back, we'll talk about that loaded Florida State defense and also sit down with FSU's head football coach. A conversation with Coach Jimbo Fisher is up next. Stay with us on First Look Florida State Football. One, two, three. Line. I want you to understand something. This is our time. It's the very end you're breaking. It's the legacy you're leaving. And it's the direction we're going. This train rolling, boy. Welcome back. I'm joined by Coach Jimbo Fisher now. Coach, you start year three, uh, so you've been here, done that. But what's different as you assess your team through the first week of camp compared to the first two years? Well, I think that the older guys truly understand what we want. There's no doubt. And they're getting it across to the younger guys. And the younger guys, instead of everyone looking to the coaches, they now can look to the upperclassmen, and the upperclassmen can coach them through things and allow us to progress a lot faster with what we're doing. Let's talk about EJ. The quarterback always goes first in these type of interviews. So he obviously uh, has been in the program now in his fifth year, has tremendous size, good athlete. What does he need to do to take the next step in your well, estimation? I think play more consistently, and I think we have to play consistently around him. We, and for a guy to play consistent, you need to have the same offensive line in front of him for a period of time. You need to have the same group of receivers, the same group of backs. I mean, it, it, you know, it's like a batter getting a different pitch every time he swings. You know, every time you line up, you got to learn that there's a trust factor in football. That's why football is such a team game. And I think us being healthy around him, being consistent around him is going to allow his game to get better. And then when that happens, he has to quit worrying about everybody else and what's going to happen and trust and let his instincts and his anticipation really become greater. How about the running game news uh, as we tape this that Mario Pender's out for the year? But Chris Thompson apparently looks to be as good as he's ever been. He does. And people, I, I said this last year, of all the guys, Nothing against the other backs, but that guy hurt us as much as anybody we lost last year. His dependability issues in the back, always knowing what to do, always knowing who to block, always knowing who to pick up, always making the right cut, always being in the right place. And then he has great ability. You're talking about a guy two years ago that no back in FSU history has ever had three touchdown runs of 70 yards or more. And I believe he had six of over 50 at somewhere in that realm, but nobody ever did it. He can make big plays. He's a consistent guy. He can catch the ball. And then Lonnie being back, those two guys, two seniors, been around. Just Lonnie's a football player, does everything right. Having those two guys back, and then you got Devontae Freeman, then you got Wilder, then you got Smiley. Those guys are all very consistent guys. But what the older two guys allow them to do is those younger guys, they got somebody to learn from. And then I think it in increases their game. You're on record in talking about the offensive line that, uh, that you feel that it's going to be a pretty good unit this year. 
It struggled last year, obviously, and there were a lot of injuries, a lot of reasons for that. What has you excited or optimistic about? First of all, it's potential of size and speed. Big athletic guys have very good intelligence and guys that have walked on the field and done it now. Have they done it to the level we want them to do it at? No, they're getting better. But the, their potential is its as good as any position on this team, in my opinion. You mentioned the guys they're, they practice against. I'm not going to ask you to go segment by segment on the defense, but obviously the defensive line's good. This defense is going to be very good. What, uh, when, when you look at it and you see them all the time, what excites you the most about that group? Controlling the line of scrimmage. Both sides, and both, and in football, you got to control the lines of scrimmage. I don't care how many skill guys you got, how many corners, how many linebackers, how many receivers, how many running backs. You have to control the line of scrimmage. That was our, what we couldn't do last year on offense, but it's what we always did on defense. It's going to be fun to watch it unfold as it always is. Best of luck to you, Coach. Let's talk defense, which has everybody that favors the Garnet Gold and Gold awfully excited this year uh, with, with all the talent coming back. And, you know, football, you hear it all the time that uh, you win the battle at the line of scrimmage. And, and if that is, in fact, a true statement, FSU is going to be pretty doggone good at the line of scrimmage this year defensively. And, and you talk about defenses starting at that line of scrimmage in Florida State. Tommy is just absolutely loaded. Jenkins and Warner on the outside. Six, count them, six defensive tackles if you want to roll them in and out. Jacoby coming back from that very serious ankle injury. Be held out a little bit, but midterm, he's going to be back. They all are big. They're all strong. Most of them are fast, and more than anything else, they're not very nice. <laughs> When time comes to play football, uh, they get after it. Very good kids off of the field. They're just not real nice on the field, and that's exactly how you want your defensive lineman. Florida State has guys that can run at the linebacker spot. Uh, Vince Williams is a veteran. Christian Jones is a guy that uh, has all kinds of athleticism. How do you see the linebackers stacking up this year? Well, athleticism is the key at the linebacker position. What they've got to learn to do is play the position. They've got all the physical tools. And in Coach Stoops' defense, they're also going to have to learn a little bit of pass coverage. Again, that, that agility, that foot speed will help them. If they can play smart football, do assignment football, and let that defensive line protect them and then do their job at the linebacker core, you could have a couple of all-stars back there. And when you look at the secondary, speaking of all-stars, there's a couple back there. Now, obviously, significant news late in the summer that Greg Reed is not going to be back on a football team this year, a starting corner. But you have Xavier Rhodes and LaMarcus Joyner, which is half your secondary, and those are two guys that can play. And in my opinion, two guys that will be first-round draft picks at the next level. I don't think you lose that much with Greg Reed being gone other than in the return game. The kids that you've never heard about, that the coaches have been working with for a year or two, they're ready to step right in. And again, Joyner at that safety position, move from corner. I just think he's a great field general leader back there. This secondary, I think, is going to surprise a lot of people and how they can get to the ball, bat the ball down, and maybe even pick off a few. Florida State fans discuss the potential for this defense and compare it to some of the great defenses Mickey Andrews coached. Uh, more important than that, how will this compare to the defenses of today? question I'm really asking is how good is this defense going to be? Is it the best in the country? Could it be? It could be. It could very well be the best in the country, Tom. What they've got to do, this defense has got to do, is create turnovers. If they can put Florida State's offense in a short field, let EJ and company get up points early, then Stoops can turn things back. Those ends can peel their ears back. They can rotate those tackles in and out. They can get the secondary uh, backups in there, get a lot of experience, but yet play great defense. And I think that's a key. I I think they can, and candidly, I think they will. Special teams, the third component, and it's not a component that is treated as if it's not as equally important. I mean, Jimbo Fisher runs a lot of starters out there. It's part of his philosophy. And, and Eddie Grant's uh, specialty teams has been among the elite in the country the last few years. Now, this year, Sean Powell doesn't return, so you have a new punter. But you have the same place kicker back in Dustin Hopkins who gives you all kinds of an advantage. Well, two things that you don't think about often in special teams. Number one, you control how often you punt. So if you don't have a lot of confidence in your punter or he's a young fella, you can keep him off the field. <laughs> Hopkins, great game experience, explosive leg, can make all the kicks. It's going to be interesting to see, though, how Florida State plays it with the new rule change. Remember, the kickoffs will now be moved up five. If you kick the ball into the end zone, the offense starts from the 25. Do you go ahead and blast it through? Do you bloop it? Do you go side to side and cut the field down? A lot more strategy goes into the kickoff. But I like D-Hop. If you're down by two with two seconds left, I'll take him any day. Return game. This is where Greg Reed, uh, you already mentioned, uh, certainly showed up. He was on pace to become the all-time leader in punt return yardage career. 
in, in Florida State history. But it's not as if Florida State is devoid of talented athletes. Uh, everybody does something a little bit different, and there's a, a host of candidates to replace Greg Reed there on the punts, and then kickoffs factor in as well. And I think what we're going to see happen is Florida State's going to run some different kids out. So the first two or three or four ball games, you may not know exactly who's returning punts, maybe more so on kickoffs. but. Anybody they put back there has got talent equal to anybody that's ever returned punts for this program. The question again is back to reps and experience. We'll step aside, we'll come back, we'll look ahead to the schedule, we'll talk more about what you can expect from this 2012 Seminole football team. So stay with us here on First Look Florida State Football. Florida State football season kicks off September 1st. I mentioned earlier four consecutive home games to start the year. Uh, obviously go on the road to USF and, and, and play 12 games in total. But Keith, as you look at the schedule, your thoughts? Two things. Number one, you've got Clemson and Florida at home. Your biggest stumbling block if you get past Clemson is, of course, Virginia Tech and Blacksburg on Thursday. you got to hope that the weather is good. I think the game in Tampa is going to be interesting. USF, just the second meeting all time between the two schools. And remember, they came up to Florida State and defeated them a couple of years ago. But I like the schedule. I think it maps itself out well. And I think if Florida State responds, stays healthy, those other things, it's a schedule that they can quote unquote win with. Preseason polls have Florida State in the top 10, between 5 and 10. Florida Florida State, Virginia Tech is the pick to, to play for the ACC championship game, which has been a familiar refrain. How do you see this season unfolding for FSU? I go back to my earlier comment about being optimistic versus anticipating. This squad anticipates that they will play in the ACC championship game, that they will win it, and they will play for the national championship. Anything less than that is not being talked about. And I think this team has enough maturity, having gone through that pressure last year, to know how to continue to do the little things, eliminate the clutter, as Coach uh, Fisher has said so many times. This squad, Tommy, I think has the best potential in the last 10, 15 years of any Florida State squad to win a national title. As always, it's going to be fun to see how the season unfolds. KJ, this was a pleasure. Uh, you'll be calling ACC Games of the Week once again, and our, our paths will cross uh, on Saturdays, I'm sure. But they'll also cross uh, as we preview Florida State's football game each and every Saturday. And you can see that on First Look Florida State Football Saturday mornings right here on Sun Sports. Thanks so much for joining us. Enjoy the season. And we'll see you next time.